Good morning. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm pleased to introduce Brett Swanson. Mr. Swanson is president of Entropy Economics, a research firm focused on technology and the global economy, and the Entropy Capital, a venture firm that invests in early stage tech technolo technology companies. He is also a scholar at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation and a visiting fellow at the American Enterprise Institute's Center for Internet, Communications, and Technology Policy. He previously was a senior fellow at the Prog Progress and Freedom Foundation, where he directed the Center for Global Innovation for eight years, advised technology investors as an executive editor of the Gilder Technology Report. Today, Mr. Swanson presents his exaflood research across the globe, writes a column for Forbes, blobs at techpolicydaily.com, and often contributes to the editorial page of the Wall Street Journal on topics ranging from broadband networks to, to China to monetary policy. Mr. Swanson studies innovation, globalization, China, internet traffic, information theory, the stock market, and entrepreneurial economics. His most pioneering and speculative research, however, concerns forces even more powerful and enigmatic: his four children. Today, he will present a talk titled, Great Stagnation or Technological Renaissance. Please silence your electronic devices, but don't put them away. We want to see you tweeting to the hashtag Dawn or Doom. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Swanson. Thank you so much for that introduction, and it is great to be here at Purdue. I spend all my time studying science and technology and its effect on the economy, and so it's really an honor to be at one of the world's great institutions of, of science and technology, although I do have to wonder what my, what my late grandfather would have said of me being here at Purdue. He was captain of the Indiana basketball team back in 1942-43, so, uh, but anyway, Purdue's a, a wonderful place, and I, I've enjoyed coming here. I live down, just down the road in Zionsville, Indiana, and um, today I'm going to talk about uh, the technology economy. Um, and consistent with the sort of title of our conference, Dawn or Doom, is technology sometimes seems almost miraculous, sometimes it seems very scary. There's a lot of commentary about the economy these days that sort of mirrors that Dawn or Doom title. You often hear especially with the bad economy the last few years. Technical innovation the last several decades has really slowed. We're in a great stagnation. On the other hand, you hear technology is moving so fast that robots are going to steal all the jobs. These seem to be paradoxical opposites. In fact, we often hear the robots will steal all the jobs if, that is, artificial intelligence doesn't wipe out the human race first. So which is it? Is, in, has innovation slowed? Are we not innovating anymore? Or are we innovating too fast? We struggle with a lot of these um, questions, trying to figure out what, just what is going on with technology, and especially its effect on the economy today. So I'm going to try to go through and talk about these uh, various perspectives, try to present some data, try to present some research, maybe speculate a little bit. But we've been thinking about these topics for a very long time. This isn't necessarily a new uh, thing that we're trying to figure out. We're not the first ones that have struggled to figure out just what is happening with technology. How do we measure technology? How do we measure its effect on the economy? Here's a story from October of 1910 in the New York Times. It was about a uh, contest that had just been sponsored. Uh, trying to measure whether automobiles were better than horses. <laughs> and so you can see that we've been trying to figure out these things for a very long time. Uh, a six-day test shows that motor car is, in fact, cheaper and more, more efficient than an animal. Um, it sounds funny to us today that this was even a question, because after this, of course, Last century went on to become the, the, the century of the automobile, and that was a big part of the American century in catapulting the U.S. to worldwide dominance in the economy and, and technology. But at the time, this was a question, and these were the sort of metrics that they were looking at. They were measuring 
How much gasoline and oil did an automobile consume over this several day test? How much oats and hay did the horse consume? How far did they travel? And you can see at the bottom, the, uh, the uh, automobile did end up winning the cost of uh, about 16, or yeah, 1, 1.6 cents per passenger mile. It did, in fact, beat out the horse, but only just barely. <laughs> so today I'm going to talk about the sort of current state of the US economy. Uh, is there, in fact, uh, a 40-year stagnation, as some have, have, have said? Is stagnation a more recent development? Or is that idea of stagnation wrong altogether? Then I'm going to talk a little bit about Moore's Law. I wrote a big paper earlier this year uh, on the occasion of Moore's Law's 50th anniversary, uh, sort of an assessment. Uh, what has Moore's Law meant technologically, economically over the last 50 years? Where is Moore's, Law's, Moore's Law going? And what does it mean for the economy? Uh, I'm gonna talk, then I'm going to talk about uh, the productivity gap, especially in, in, in health care, and, and posit that that probably has uh, a lot to do with uh, what you might call stagnation to this point, but also talk about the huge opportunities in technology and healthcare. Uh, I'm going to wrap that in a larger case for optimism, in my view. Uh, talk about a number of different technologies uh, that I think will propel the economy over the, the next several decades. And then I'm going to talk also about uh, public policies that I think either encourage or discourage uh, economic growth. Um, uh, and that'll be, that'll be the, the conclusion of, of my talk and talk about just how important compound growth is for, uh, for living standards. First, a little bit on the sort of what you may call the, the dismal view. Several years ago, a terrific economist, Tyler Cowen, um, came out with a book called The Great Stagnation. And this was uh, 2011, so we'd been into the after the financial panic. We've been several years into the Great Recession. But his view was that actually this Great Recession was the result of a longer term, really four decade stagnation in which, uh, yeah, we, there's been a lot of apparent innovation, especially in, in information technology. But across the board, we haven't, hadn't been innovating as fast as we did before that in transportation and energy and, and so forth. Um, more recently, Robert Gordon, an economist at Northwestern University, has written about what he calls the demise of U.S. economic growth, where we're growing slower today and we can expect to grow much more slowly in the decades to come. A real downgrade in the possibilities of the U.S. economy, he said. Um, he acknowledges the information revolution, but he says it's far less powerful than the agricultural or industrial revolutions, and in any case, he thinks that the information age may already have ended. Uh, and then I always like to bring this one up. Um, writing back in 1998, well-known economist Paul Krugman said that uh, by the year 2005, we will view the internet as no more powerful than the fax machine. Um, and we sort of chuckle at that today because the internet, we, we, we think, is sort of one of the real key sources of innovation. And yet at the same time, even today, people still think, as Tyler Cowen had, has, has said, that the internet is a great source of, 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 of fun and enjoyment and entertainment, but not really a source of, of uh, rising incomes and jobs. And so that still is a question, despite the huge um, role that the internet plays in our, in, our, in our daily lives. Here's more digging down deeper into sort of the, the, the dismal view, I call it, about what's happened over the last couple decades. A lot of people say that, that incomes, in this case labeled as hourly compensation, since the early 70s has not kept up with productivity. So the top line showing productivity, how much output we uh, generate per, per hour, is not translating into income for the average worker. Uh, there are a variety of explanations for this. They say that um, 
you know, more of the income of the productivity that we do have is going towards people at the top, uh, et cetera, and that the average workers aren't uh, seeing, these, seeing these gains, and they think that this is a major uh, uh, source of declining uh, or at least stagnating living standards and demands a, a robust public policy responses. Another way of looking at this um, dismal view, uh, Thomas Piketty and uh, others have argued that if you look at the average income of the bottom 90 percent, their view is that living standards have not risen since 1968. Um, this is a very, you know, uh, I, I guess you'd say uh, widely shared argument in today's economic debate. They say despite all the apparent innovation, uh, uh, incomes for the average person are, are not growing since 1968, they say. My own view, I think there's a lot of evidence to uh, call into question or even disprove this, this very dismal view. So if you look at the data, the w one reason I think this, these, these arguments are, are probably wrong is that they don't use the right price indexes. So if you lose sort, use sort of the old crude uh, consumer price index, uh, you might get this dismal picture. If you use even a slightly more modern price index like personal consumption expenditures, uh, you get a much, much healthier picture. So for example, if you just use the PCE versus the CPI, instead of a 4% growth in income over the last 40 years, you get something like 35% growth. But there are lots of other factors as well. They compare productivity apples with income oranges. Um, they don't count total compensation. So they're just looking at av average hourly wages. But our economy today is much different. It doesn't depend nearly as much on sort of hourly wages. Um, so they, they don't inc include benefits, which are a much larger portion of our total compensation package today. So health insurance, for example. They don't count government benefits, say like food stamps. They also don't account for taxes. So taxes on the middle class have actually uh, dropped dramatically over the last 40 years, giving us uh, more income. They also don't th account for things like realized capital gains, which are in the trillions of dollars. They also don't account for around $20 trillion that we have in 401ks and IRAs and other private savings plans. So they, um, in effect, undercount income dramatically and overestimate inflation dramatically. Um, and so I think these are all things that, are, that sort of uh, call into question this dismal view of the last 40 years uh, and stagnating middle, uh, middle class incomes. Another way to think about it, real consumption per person over the last four decades has tripled. So how do you say you've had have flat incomes but we've tripled our real consumption? The other thing, and I'm going to talk more about this, is that I don't think a lot of the data, whether it's their data they use, the data I like to look out, accounts for technological innovation very well. Um, and this isn't anybody's fault, although we can do more research and we can have better methods. It's just the nature of exponential change is very, very difficult to measure. I do think, having said that I don't think we've had a great stagnation over the last 40 years, I do think there's cause for concern over the economic performance over this last eight to 10 years, say, especially since the Great Recession and the financial panic. Here's a um, data in the, the gray line. You can see US real GDP, US economic output. Um, and you can see here, really up until the Great Recession, which you can see there quite clearly, Long-term U.S. growth rate, whether you go back to the 60s, whether you go back 200 years, whether you go back 400 years, has been averaged about 3%, maybe a little bit more per year. That's our long-term historical growth rate. You can see that since the, and, and you can see that if we had continued that 
average 3% growth since the Great Recession, you can see where we would be. Uh, but we haven't. We've only grown maybe 2% uh, since then. And you can see that if the U.S. had kept growing at our historical rate, the economy today would be over $2 trillion larger than it is in 2015. That's per year in GDP. Um, my view is that this more recent down, down, downgrade of the U.S. economy's growth rate is much more responsible for the pain that the middle class is feeling today than any 40-year trend. Um, you can see it in a number of different data sets. This one I like to look at. Uh, you know, today we have the, the unemployment rate is 5.1%, which doesn't sound too bad. But if you look at the number of people actually working who have, and, and people that have dropped out of the labor force altogether, it paints a, 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 a more concerning picture. So this is the civilian labor force participation rate. And I'm not counting teenagers or college students, and I'm not counting retirees. So this tends to um, uh, account for some demographic factors. We're not counting you know, retiring baby boomers, et cetera. We're looking at people 25 to 54 years old. And so you, you see this real, this real drop in the number of people that are, uh, that are in the workforce. Uh, now you can see it, 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 this drop started in the previous re recession in 2000, but it really accelerated uh, after the financial panic and Great Recession. And this is, uh, this is cause, for, cause for real concern, I think. The other thing that you can s say is that, although I don't think incomes have stagnated over the last 40 years, I think if you look at the median income data and account for all the factors that I looked at, there is there is a, a lot of evidence that median incomes have been sta stagnating for the last eight to 10 years. Now, that's the economy today. I want to talk more about techno technological trends over the last 50 years and where we're going. I love this picture. It shows a, this is data storage circa 1956. Uh, they're loading a, an IBM ram back storage system onto an airplane with a forklift. This data storage system had a capacity of about 3.75 megabytes, which is about equivalent to one digital song. Uh, it's hard for probably some of the younger people in our audience today to, to, to think about that. Um, and, as well, IBM rented this storage system to big companies that were crunching lots of data for $3,000 a month. In fact, that'd be about $30,000 per month in today's dollar, in, in, in today's uh, dollars. So it's, it's fun to, to look at how far we've come. And I think pictures like this often can tell us more about uh, you know, how far we've come and, and, and about our economic, whether there has, in fact, been a great stagnation than, than lots of data. You can look at this and see we've come a long way. Another question I like to, I, to ask, I've done some, some work on this, I've written a couple articles about it. Anybody in the audience born in 1995, near 1995? We have born in 1995, 1994, 96, 96. We have a few members of the audience born in 1995. How, any guesses? So an iPhone 6 um, today, uh, you know, real c you can buy it for a couple hundred dollars through a carrier. If you just buy the device alone, it might cost six or seven hundred dollars. Any idea how much that iPhone 6 with its processing and storage capacity would have cost to build in 1995? Not just those born. Forty thousand dollars. How many? Well over a million. Uh, a, a rough estimate, if you look at the processing power, the data storage, the communications capacity, and some of the other factors, around $5 million to make one iPhone. And now, several billion people across the planet have smartphones. Uh, in a couple of years, probably 
six or seven billion, <laughs> nearly every person on the planet will have a smartphone that just two decades ago would have cost five million dollars a piece to build. This is another way that I like to think about how fast we are moving. Some more research that I did um, into Moore's Law uh, from my paper earlier this year. Um, you know, Moore's Law, since 1965, when Gordon Moore, the founder of Intel, wrote that first paper plotting just a few data points, saying, I think that transistor counts on integrated circuits, which were very new then, are going to keep doubling about every year, 18 months, two years. I think we can do it, at least through 1975, he thought. And, and they did it. And then they kept doing it year after year after year. And Moore's Law powered the era of the computer and the personal computer and then the internet. But about a decade ago, about, a, about 15 years ago, people started seeing a problem on the horizon. The, we were packing so many transistors on chips, uh, but we couldn't continue de decreasing voltages um, as we needed to to keep down the heat problem. So chips, as they could see if we kept going down this path, chips were going to heat up to the, you know, the, 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 have a power density of a rocket nozzle and eventually the surface of the sun. And that was obviously unacceptable. So they thought that Moore's law was going to run out. And in fact, as they predicted, around the year 2004, 2005, clock speeds of chips. Remember in the 90s when you used to buy personal computers, Intel would market their chips. How, you know, how many megahertz uh, was your chip? How fast was it? We used to measure uh, chips basically by their clock speeds. That's how good we, th we knew, uh, thought a chip was. Well, around the year 2004, 2005, because of this heat issue, we sort of had to level off clock speeds. And a lot of people said, this is the end of Moore's law. Chips just aren't going to uh, keep providing that exponential uh, growth like we thought they would. And this possibly could decrease the overall innovation and growth rate of the economy. So you can see in this gray line, clock speeds did in fact level off. Um, but no, another, uh, several other uh, innovations helped compensate for those leveling off clock speeds. We developed multi-core architectures. Putting multiple processors on the same chip was one of the key uh, innovations. And among others, this is also when we started developing um, parallel computing architectures through cloud computing, which spread processing over many more processors. Um, and so if you look at a measure of processor performance, not just clock speed, but how many operations are we able to perform, you can see on the blue line that in fact per processor performance did keep growing after 2000. Five, and if you look in the right hand scale, uh, r r lower right hand corner, you can see it in a linear scale. Um, the gray line at the bottom is what clock speeds did, but uh, chip performance kept growing. Another interesting thing is trying to measure the price of computation. So, again, this is a problem that we have with official measures of, of things that are growing exponentially. Yeah, the, gray, the gray line, you can see the producer price index for computer chips, or microprocessors specifically. Um, now this is a, uh, you know, a logarithmic scale. So the official government PPI um, says that $100 worth of computing in 2000 could, by the year 2013, be purchased for just $1.31. Now that is, in any other field, that would be completely remarkable. Getting, uh, a, a, you know, getting the, the same amount of processing of just 13 years before for just over a dollar. That seems remarkable. And yet, measured against the previous several decades of Moore's Law, it did seem like this was leveling off. You can see the right-hand part of that, that gray line. It does seem like prices weren't falling as fast as they, they used to be. Maybe this is cause for stagnation, slower rate of innovation. In fact, I don't think the government's been, been measuring this right. And both the previous chart and this chart 
are data from a uh, colleague of mine at the American Enterprise Institute named Steve Oliner, terrific economist. And he shows that, in fact, if you measure processing power of chips correctly, um, computation, the price of computation did keep falling. And the actual, not actual, a better estimate of the measure of the price of computation in 2013 was just 4.8 cents. So in fact, we, we, consumers today can buy 27 times more computer power for the same price than the official data suggests. This is another example of, of how difficult it is to measure these exponentials, their impact on the economy, and why we may be underestimating our standards of living with some of the official uh, government income and price index data. Um, this is just one example. This is just microprice processors. But how do we measure the cost effectiveness of software? How do we measure the consumer surpluses that we get from things like Wikipedia? All these things that we get online and from the digital world that are really for free, but we would will it be willing to pay for. The estimates are hard to gauge, but we probably get hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars of consumer per surplus per year that doesn't get counted in a lot of the official data. Suggests that we're, we may be better off than the official data suggests. More reason for optimism if you, at, at, at how the American, especially tech economy, has done. If you look at just the uh, value of seven of the top American technology firms, Apple, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, Amazon, Oracle, Intel. The total market cap, and these numbers are from late July, so it, it's changed a little bit since then, to almost $2.4 trillion. This is American innovation. If you compare, compare that to the entire stock market of Germany, Australia, or India, just our seven leading tech companies together are larger than the entire stock markets of the, uh, these other uh, major countries. Um, this is just another measure of, of, of American innovation. Another thing, and this is, I've spent a lot of time studying this. Um, I like to use internet traffic as a basic measure of how much we're using the internet, what is the health of our broadband ecosystem, what are, uh, it, it's, a, it's, I think, a better measure of uh, broadband deployment, broadband speed, mobile deployment, mobile usage, as well as a better measure of actually how much value are we getting from the internet. There's been a lot of debate over the last decade about whether the US had fallen behind in broadband uh, and mobile, whether it's t uh, Asians, uh, Asian uh, countries or European countries. Um, I think that this simplifies the, uh, the, 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 the problem a little bit. And in fact, the US generates and consumes between two and three times the internet traffic of most advanced countries around the world. We're second only to South Korea, and we're probably going to pass them in the next couple of years. Um, uh, pardon me. I think this is a big uh, indicator of our, uh, the health of our broadband infrastructure as well as the health of our content markets uh, over the internet. Looking a little bit more broadly, uh, I think there's, despite our real challenges today and especially since the the uh, Great Recession, I think there's a lot of reason for optimism for the next couple decades. I think, yes, Moore's Law, it is going to get a little bit more difficult to keep shrinking transistors. We've got some fundamental atomic limits. Once transistors shrink towards, you know, and the, the width is just a couple atoms thick, we may not be able to, we're not going to be able to go uh, further on the existing way of building chips. But we're experimenting with all sorts of new materials, whether it's carbon nanotubes or graphene or gallium arsenide or germanium or combinations of these materials. Um, 
new designs, more parallel processing, 3D chip stacking, using different state variables like spin and polarization and so forth. Um, and then also the very use of, of, of macro parallel architectures. So uh, we'll, we'll keep advancing in, in cloud computing and cluster computing. I think that some combination of all these things will allow us to more or less continue the Moore's Law path that we've seen over the last several decades, even if it's not using the same metrics as, uh, uh, of transistor density uh, that we've used. Um, we have the Internet of Things. So think about it this way. Uh, a friend of mine, Michael Mandel, likes to think of, say, until this point, the Internet has affected about 20% of the economy. So finance, content, media. Um, but we're just about, over the next several years, several decades, to apply the internet to the other 80% of the economy. So call it the internet of things. Um, this will allow us to apply the productivity advances of the internet to that other 80% of the economy that we, it really hasn't touched yet. That's reason for optimism. Software will keep on, in Mark Andreessen's phrase, eating the world. We'll keep on making uh, uh, creative products uh, with software and apps and, and whether it's uh, things like uh, Uber or whether it's um, uh, in healthcare, and I'll talk about that more. Virtual reality, I think, is the next phase of web content. Cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin are going to establish better financial platforms for the web and for everything else. Um, energy is, has been a bright spot the last few years, but we can still unleash uh, energy uh, in even greater ways. Um, and, and far from being a, a constraint, I think energy is, is, is still an opportunity. And then a big one that I'm going to talk a little bit more in detail, and I just wrote a paper on this that came out earlier this week, it's what I call the apification of medicine. So, and, and, it, and most simply, this is the transformation of healthcare into a true information industry. This is what, one of those things we talked about. Um, where the internet and computation and thinking about health and medicine and biology in information terms will allow us to completely transform the industry um, uh, and, and impact both people's health directly and, uh, uh, and see wider ripples across the economy and create more economic growth. So healthcare for the last several decades although we have the world's best doctors and nurses and hospitals and technology, and we're very lucky in that way, um, healthcare is, is, is not productive. So where other industries, we get more output com compared to the amount of input we get in. If you look at it where average annual productivity for most of the economy has been about 2% over the last couple decades, healthcare productivity actually declined. We're using more people and more resources to get less out, at least as we measure it. Again, this is, it's a difficult thing to measure. But over 20 years, that's a productivity differential of about 60%. So considering that healthcare is about a sixth of the economy, this is a real drag on our over, overall economic productivity and economic growth. But what if we could convert, transform healthcare from a productivity laggard into a productivity leader? If one-sixth of the economy is transformed, it means a huge overall boon for the overall economic growth and incomes, et cetera, not to mention standards of living and, and overall health, longevity, living longer, better lives. And so my new paper, The Appification of Medicine, it's called Four Facets of the Information Revolution in Health. I think about it this way. And you can organize it in, in your own way, but this is the way I view what's happening in, in healthcare. The first facet is the way that smartphones and other personal technology is, um, you know, with, with, with supercomputers in our pocket connected healthcare apps, um, watches, wristbands that help measure our health, uh, implantable devices, ingestible devices that will 
help measure our metabolism, our vital signs, communicate it to our doctors, keep track of our data over long periods of time, uh, devices that will be able to look into our own ears, look into our own eyes, uh, sense the chemical composition of our breath. Uh, these types of things are going to dramatically change the, the way that we collect data on health, the way that we, uh, the, the, the uh, ability to do self-diagnostics, the way that we communicate with our physicians and, and nurses. The second facet is big data and social data. So as we collect all this information, radically more information than we've ever had before, um, and put it in huge databases, and uh, we are going to be able to do lots, lots, much, much better uh, and wide-ranging research on much better uh, collections of data and correlate this data with data going uh, from previously, from family histories, um, uh, and then integrate it, which the next facet, which I think is probably the most fundamental information technology in this application of medicine, which is our, our truly radical new understanding of the code of life. So obviously 1953, Watson and Crick discovering DNA, wonderful achievement. Um, 2000, decoding the genome, wonderful achievement. But if you looked at the first 10 or 10 years after we de decoded the genome, some people say that the actual practical applications might have been underwhelming. You know, in 2000, we decode the genome, genome. A lot of people, I think, thought, well, in five years, we're going to have cured cancer. We're going to cure all these other diseases. But maybe the practical implications didn't come as fast as we thought. Now, 15 years afterwards, as we've done lots of work in genomics and proteomics and, um, you know, figuring out these very complex information networks in our bodies, um, we are really, really starting to see uh, astounding uh, advances um, in, in treatments and cures uh, for a range of diseases and conditions. And I think we're just on the cusp of a huge um, advance in the next uh, several years and, and several decades. And so combining these techniques, this, this, this macro data with the micro understanding of, of, of the information inside our bodies uh, and the way cells and, uh, uh, and, and, and our genetic code interact with each other is going to be uh, really, really powerful. The last facet, which is, is very important to generate as much information, uh, as much innovation as possible in the first three facets. And this is what I call the appification of the business of healthcare. So today, for a variety of reasons, we sort of have a top-down structure in healthcare that's dominated by, um, you know, by large health systems, uh, by large third-party payers, whether it's Medicare or Medicaid or nominally private health insurers, um, and so forth. And this creates a sort of stagnant uh, uh, industry where you don't have as much entrepreneurship and experimentation and innovation that you have in, in, in other industries. If we can unlock this industry so that physicians are freed to use technology and create new firms uh, at a rate that we see in other parts of the economy, um, so that large health systems are free to innovate uh, so that consumers are truly in, empowered with personal technology uh, so that we can bring down the cost of insurance uh, by not forcing people to, to choose among a very small uh, set of insurance products. If we can uh, allow uh, patients to become, to, to tr transform the business of healthcare to be much more consumer centric so people have an incentive to uh, care about what their treatment costs, that will truly set off a, a, an innovation explosion across all of these facets and is why I think 
although healthcare has been a drag on the economy to this point, I think could be a, um, a, a huge boon over the next several decades. Here's just an example of the dramatic uh, reduction in cost of, of, say, sequencing a genome, which is one metric and why we're making so much product or so much progress in, this, uh, in, these, um, uh, uh, in, the, in the code of life, is what I call it. I want to talk a little bit about the importance of policy um, for encouraging innovation in, in, in the internet, which is sort of the foundation of our digital economy. So in order for all these things to work across the economy, uh, we've got to have this digital foundation by which we compute and communicate and all of our devices plug into. Um, and in my view, the internet, is, especially in the US, has been a historic success story. We lead the world in digital infrastructure, consumer usage, usage entrepreneurship over the last 20 years. We've invested about 1.3 trillion in broadband infrastructure. And it really shows that a sort of a bipartisan approach uh, begun under the Clinton administration, continued after that, has really worked. I do have a worry that today policy is, uh, uh, is reversing itself. Last winter, the Federal Communications Commission adopted a very big change in the way we regulate the internet. We've basically had, until this point, for the last several decades, a very free, open, entrepreneurial system. Um, now, the FCC has imposed the old Title II telephone rules uh, thought up in, well, before that, but first imposed in 1934, applying that to the internet. In my view, this is a huge mistake. It's, it's in the courts right now. So we'll see, it'll take a year or two or maybe more to be, to be fought through the courts. But in my view, it's exactly the wrong way to think about this vibrant uh, ecosystem of the internet is to propose the 80-year-old telephone rules to this uh, amazing industry. Um, there are going to be lots of other policy questions across the board uh, in, in, in all our different industries, um, but especially the ones that are affected by the industry. Privacy, we talked a lot about that last night with uh, Bart Gelman's uh, keynote. Um, security, cybersecurity, uh, the Internet of Things is going to have lots of surprising um, policy questions. It's going to, you know, great opportunities, but also lots of uh, surprising policy questions. Think about labor and liability law for the peer-to-peer -peer economy, the way that Uber now is facing challenges to its independent contractor model. Um, what are we going to do with uh, robocars, drones, 3D printing? You know, today people are even, you know, they're, they, they're using uh, Uber and Lyft to shuttle their kids around and so forth. It's great. But think about it. Once we have autonomous cars, robocars, can you put your three-year-old in a driverless car and send them off to grandma's house? I don't know. Maybe you can, maybe you can't. But there, there are going to be lots of these questions that uh, Bitcoin and financial regulation, there are going to be lots of questions. Um, again, if we really, really want to have a, a, a rapid innovation in healthcare, we're probably going to have to change the way that um, the FDA regulates these things, um, that, that the current model is just not suited for the, the new world of, um, of, of, of information medicine. So I just want to finish up quickly, a couple minutes, on what this all means for the larger economy. Um, you know, Einstein was said to have said that uh, the most powerful force in the world is compound interest. Uh, you know, this is a guy who, you know, the great discoverer of uh, physical laws, uh, but he said that compound interest was actually the, the greatest force in the world. And it turns out that was probably apocryphal. He, he probably didn't say that, but whoever said that he said that was pretty smart. Um, Again, Moore's Law, what is it? Moore's Law is basically a, a force of compound growth, right? That's why it's so incredibly powerful. And 
you can see over the last couple of years, the economy growing at 2% rather than our historical rate of 3% really does create some dislocation. If we can, if we can more, um, if we can boost our growth rate by some of the innovations that I've talked about, talked about by unlocking a couple important uh, sectors of the economy, we can boost our long-term growth rate, and it really has dramatic effects on incomes, on government budgets, etc. Um, I'm going to come back to this maybe in closing, but think about this: if we continue to grow two percent a year over the next 33 years up to nearly the year 2050, compared to our historical growth rate of around 3%, the economy in 2047 is going to be $19 trillion smaller than it otherwise would be. That tells you just how powerful uh, compound growth is. What does that mean? Um, over that period, uh, growing 3% as opposed to 2.5% would generate an additional government revenue, just at the federal level, of $20 trillion. Now, the entire unfunded liability of Medicare is around $20, $25 trillion. So if we could just get the economy to grow a little bit faster with a little bit more innovation, it has huge implications for government budgets over time. Another way to look at this a little bit shorter term, the 10-year difference. What if we could grow 4% for the next 10 years, which I think is possible? We could generate over $5 trillion in extra government revenue without increasing taxes, doing anything else. Um, if we could just grow 3.5% over the next 10 years, we could generate over two, nearly $3 trillion. That's how powerful little increases in growth based on technology and innovation can get us. So these, these questions are really important. Uh, for the way they affect individual lives and they, the way they affect our, um, uh, our nation. I want to go back to this chart just for a second as I, as I finish up, and then I'm happy to discuss all these things with you. Um, I, uh, being a Catholic, I've, I've been excited to see the Pope in the, in the U.S. the last several days. Um, I do think coming from Argentina, he may not have as much of an appreciation as I'd like for the way free enterprise uh, helps individual people and relieves poverty and, uh, and, and create and, and allows the human individuals to flourish. Um, uh, I, I hope that his visit to the U.S. maybe will help him understand how the free enterprise system actually does help humans grow and flourish and, and alleviate poverty. If you look across the world over the last 50 years since, since, say, Moore's Law. There are lots of complicated factors. But if you look at the way free enterprise has spread across the world, so China and India and in, in Africa and the former uh, Soviet republics and, uh, and, and South America, we have seen a dramatic reduction in poverty. We've brought probably more than 2 billion people out of poverty over this period in which technology and free, free enterprise is spread across the world. So it's a wonderful force, force for good. And uh, I think we can, we can keep, keep going. And um, I, in, in closing, I'd say I don't think there's a great stagnation. I think we're, we've had a little uh, downward blip, but I think the next several decades there's uh, much reason for optimism and that we probably are, in, uh, are ready for a new technology renaissance. So thank you so much for having me to Purdue, and I'd love to discuss some of these things with you. Thanks. <laughs> Any questions? Challenges? Sure. Uh, you can uh, either search for it. Um, Appification of Medicine, Brett Swanson, it should probably come up. Uh, you can also go to my website. It's right at the top left corner of my website, which is entropyeconomics.com. Um, and if those fail, I'm happy to uh, give you the link after, after the talk here.
Yes, back here. We can hear you. You come in today with a child, and if there are certain conditions present, like a fever or a certain temperature or whatever, you also have to do meningitis testing and everything else like that. Well, anyone who does anything with testing knows that the majority of your tests are actually going to be false, right? That's the whole point of it, is, right. is that, you know. But that cost, nonetheless, is soaked up by the entire economy. So that little bump in risk aversion to catch that, that one child that has meningitis, and that sounds kind of cold to say this, but that one, that one uh, um, instance where he did have meningitis, or she did, you're doing 10,000 tests to catch that. And that cost gets soaked up by the whole system. That's not even getting to the whole third period problem that you're, you were talking about too. And so the, the we are going to have to accept the rollback in, in the level of risk that, that we are going to, we're going to have to accept a, a slightly higher level of risk for a much improved cost. I think it's going to happen regardless. And an example of that, um, I was talking to you know, Steve Lord the other day, the, the 23andMe company that did genetic, that does a, um, a la carte genetic testing, uh, recently got smacked down by the FDA because the FDA says, hey, you guys are practicing medicine, stop it. They say, no, we're doing math. No, you're practicing medicine. Math, medicine, math. Well, I mean, I don't, I don't know the company, but from my perspective, why don't they just pack up, move offshore, Right, where they're outside of the influence of the U.S. regulation on that, and how does that change their business anyway? Right, and I think that that's kind of the future. Is we've already talked about health tourism, about where people have gone to Mexico, Thailand, places like that for certain procedures. I see that as a big growth market, unless the FDA is willing to, to get out of the way on some of this. Those are all wonderfully thoughtful comments. I think that that is a terrific um, summary. Um, Couple things just on the risk aversion. I agree with you, the, the FDA, the way it does things now with having both efficacy and safety and trying to prove things well beyond, and, and then we have all the issue, you know, issues of defensive medicine and so forth. That's all true, and we may have to accept a little bit higher level of risk, although what if we can put most of those tests within the hands of the consumer so that they are measuring either via, you know, call them nanobots or sensors floating throughout our bodies or with our smartphones. What if we can do a hundred tests on ourselves 
uh, and, and, and do more of that through computation rather than through a visit to the doctor and a lab, uh, a lab workup. So we can get around part of that. Um, but I do think you're right that the FDA is going to have to fundamentally rethink this because more individuals are going to be, uh, you know, sort of looking at customized solutions to their own health as they m know, we know more about our own individual genetic makeup, our own uh, health, and we're going to have more individualized cocktails of, of uh, and. And the FDA just is fundamentally not suited today to approve or disprove, disapprove of, the, of this much more diverse way that we're going to be doing medicine. And so I'm not saying it's an, easy, it's an easy thing to overcome. And I'm not saying they have an easy job. And it's, it's, I can, you, know, you can be critical of the way they do things in some areas. Um, but I do think we need to rethink the way we, we do that. But boy, your comments are really thoughtful. Yes? Yeah, so privacy is a huge issue in healthcare. You talk, talk about HIPAA, which is a, a very, you know, very important. Uh, thing in healthcare to pr protect health information, um, and in many ways it's very important. I'll, in other ways, you know, you hear healthcare practitioners uh, think, and, and even some patients view that it holds them back because it, it really makes the system very cumbersome. And in this new era, there are going to be lots more questions because we're going to be generating a lot more data. We're going to have more data about ourselves. We want our physicians and healthcare systems to have more data so they can actually use it. But it may require an adjustment among individuals and among public policymakers about, you know, with today's current health privacy laws and, and, and rules. We, we may have to find a new balance of, 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 of privacy and, and data for these things to be as powerful as we want them to be. And we're probably not going to go all the way in another direction, but I think there's a lot of evidence that whether it's the FDA or whether it's HIPAA or whether it's health insurance, um, that, that the, the structures that we have today are just not well suited for this much more personalized era that we're entering. Um, and so, like you said, part of it is technology has a tendency to force changes on society and public policymakers. And part of it will come in that direction. On the other hand, public policy that's rigid can also tend to slow technology down. So, um, you know, my view is that the opportunities, I, I you know, uh, I like to say I'm sort of a dawn monger. You know, some people are doom mongers. I'm sort of a dawn monger. Um, so I tend to th be more optimistic about set setting technology free to solve people's problems. Um, and so I think we need to readjust that balance. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a good question. Any others? If not, thank you so much for having me to Purdue, and thanks for coming. Appreciate it.